Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm back with Jane Friedman. Hi Jane. Hello Joanna, great to be here again. Oh, it's great to have you back on the show. I think it's number four over the last like six years that you've been coming on the show. <laughs> So we're not going to delve into your background today, um, but just for a quick introduction for anyone new to you, Jane has 20 years of experience in the publishing industry and is a professor at the University of Virginia. She's the co-founder and editor of The Hot Sheet, the essential publishing industry newsletter for authors, the former publisher of Writer's Digest, and she maintains an award-winning, fantastic blog for writers at janefriedman.com. And her latest book is The Business of being a writer, which has just come out. So Jane, start by telling us why this book now, like from you, because you're, you've you been much more in that academic side, you know, why has that historically not been a thing and why is it now a thing? Well, there are two things I've noticed over the last five years in particular. Um, one is that at the largest annual gathering of writers in the United States, uh, AWP, which is a, it's a conglomerate of writing programs and writers. It's on the more literary end of the spectrum. Like 12,000 people every year come to this event. And I started hearing this common refrain on panels, which was, I wish someone had told me how hard it would be financially after I got my degree. And then the other thing I kept hearing, well, I shouldn't say hearing, reading specifically online, but also anecdotally hearing people talking about, I, I debuted my first novel or first book, whatever that might be. And I just thought something more would happen. <laughs> and they're like, this, <laughs> I'm suddenly surprised that this is not a full-time living. Uh, I thought, you know, I made it after I got my agent and my book contract. And so I felt like there these things should not be revelations. Like there is something that's missing along the educational spectrum for early career writers, at least in the United States, especially on the M like MFA creative writing program end of things. Mm -hmm. So that's why this book, that's why it's from a university press. I want it to I wanted to make it as friendly and easy as possible for writing professors to look at it, to accept it because it's been vetted <laughs> by, you know, through the peer review process, like trying to get more of the business information into the classroom so that people are not surprised at what it takes to make a living. Wow, that's really interesting because, and that answers some of the questions I'm going to come back to later around that academic press, but basically what you're saying is this information, because because I read it, it's a fantastic book, but in the indie space, this stuff is well known because we have to, we know we have to do this. But what you're saying is that just hasn't been tackled in the lit more literary, is it the literary end of traditional publishing or all traditionally published authors who just haven't even looked at this? It depends, but especially the more literary end of the spectrum, people who are studying this more formally, the people who are largely taught that you have to focus on the art and the craft and the business might even in fact be beneath you. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, and of course I'm, we've talked about that sort of mindset on and off over the years. Um, and of course you're so good at talking about the entrepreneurial mindset, but I think this is like, this is just not a conversation that's very accepted in certain circles, uh, at least in the U S I can't speak to the UK. You probably could though. Oh, well, I think it's even more behind. I think, uh, you know, as ever, you know, you will, hopefully your book, I think your book is relevant w to whatever country people are in. And as ever, I think Americans are ahead on these things. So we'll probably see this coming into the British MFAs in a couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> but but just on that, so, and have you faced any backlash? I mean, I guess you're already quite out in terms of business. You're already like a business-minded creative. Um, but have you seen, you know, have you felt any sort of negative reaction towards this? Not yet. And I, that's because it's so early. I have no doubt there's going to be some sort of pushback. And there was, it was about maybe three or four years ago, I recall writing about literary citizenship, which is a, I don't know if this is a term that would be common in the UK, but here it's kind of what I would call like platform building light, mm. uh, where you're reading and writing things in your genre. And for MFA people, like this is a more palatable form of marketing. <laughs> so to like... <laughs> talk about writers and um, reading and to write reviews. So the literary citizenship is what this is called. Mm. And I remember uh, someone wrote, again, this is in the very MFA 
geared communities, someone wrote about how literary citizenship was a ploy by traditional publishers to get authors to do more marketing. And, it, you know, it was wrong. <laughs> Uh, like, and I, it just, it was amazing to me that, that, that level of thinking went into how this, like, that everyone was being hoodwinked, that writers were being deceived, that these activities were just, um, you know, putting the burden where it shouldn't be put that publishers need to step up and do more marketing. Mm, which, you know, everyone will always say, uh, you know, <laughs> publishers should always do more marketing. Um, but, you know, as we should, I, I guess that's the thing. But let's, um, that's so interesting, but let's get into the meat of the book because, you know, my audience know they have to do marketing and, um, you know, my audience know they should be looking at business. So I was really interested and you've put a tweet out about this that I've got on my notes and I'll put in the, the show notes a link to your tweet, which is your your, um, your spread of income yourself, because of course you're an author and the book has some of your experiences. So what are the main ways, and, uh, and again, sort of circling back, I think this is another myth. The myth is that, oh, you only make money from book sales, that that is the life of a writer is, book sales are, are this massive income. <laughs> so, yes. so talk to us about your spread of the author entrepreneur income streams and what you saw in it with the book. Yeah, so, if I go back to roughly 2014, 2015, when I went full-time freelance, that's when I would say writing and book sales constituted like kind of the one to 5% of my income. So much more was related to consulting, editing, teaching. But of course, there were some reasons for that in my history. The fact that I'd been adjuncting while I was still in a day job and that I was actively blogging. So that gave me a very natural parlay into more kind of consulting and coaching types of revenue streams. So it's going to be different for everyone. But certainly, um, writing and book sales was not something that I had been focused on because I had been so blog driven and giving away information for free in order to support what I saw as the more high earning potential of consulting and teaching. Mm -hmm. So uh, over time though, like if I, you know, fast forward to 2018, four to five years have now passed and I have the hot sheet, which is the email newsletter that didn't exist when I first started um, this journey. And that's starting to become a bigger and bigger piece of the pie. And so I do think that writing is going to be like maybe half, it could be more, the mix is changing. Mm -hmm. um, and that part of that's deliberate because that's what I would like to see grow. I could fashion it in a different way. So part of what I try to explain in the book is that if you want to make a lot of money from writing, it is possible, but you have to be strategic about it. It just doesn't happen that way. <laughs> mm. And it takes years to kind of change direction, which which yeah. I think is really important. And and I like that you said that because I was the, like when I first left in 2011, about five percent of my income was what I would call scalable, which is you know create it once, keep making money from it. And my goal from the beginning was to make my income ninety five percent scalable. And yes. from what I see from your thing, I mean you do online teaching, but that can be scalable because I imagine that the you do that through Writers Digest still, I think as well. And yes. so that income keeps coming. Um, so it's really only consulting and the university stuff, which for you is non scalable, I guess. That's right. So the consulting is, in fact, something I would like to do less of. And there are periods of the year where I just shut that off because mm. I would like to focus on more scalable activity, like a self-study course or some, some content that I'm going to be selling over and over again. Yeah. Uh, so absolutely. And I stopped actually just recently university teaching because, again, it was just like the biggest time sink on my calendar and it prevented me from doing other things yeah but I like that it's great to hear that you know that it's taken you five years to go from dominant teaching to the dominant scalable and of course your scalable includes affiliate um, yes. income so can you can you talk about that because what I find is the more literary end of the scale even indies still have a bit of uh, around affiliate um, income. So could you just explain what that is and, and why it's a totally valid part of, of income? Yeah, I think most people understand affiliate income primarily from Amazon, because that's, I believe, the biggest affiliate program in the world. So once you become an Amazon affiliate, it means when you link to Amazon, you have this special link that you use, and then you get a cut of whatever sale is made. Um, 
but it's just not the product that you link to, it's the person's entire cart. So that can include computers and beauty products and um, on-demand video or a subscription to Audible. It can include so many things. And so if you're reaching a sizable audience, this can be a really meaningful part of your income. Now, I think for the literary community, the Amazon affiliate program in particular raises an issue, like a moral issue for some people who don't like Amazon because they want to support independent booksellers. Um, but I think that it's possible to still do it while encouraging people to purchase from wherever they like. It's it's um, There's a specific example I always point to, uh, Maria Popova, who does the Brain Pickings newsletter. And so she has this business model that's partly patronage, people donating, and then partly affiliate marketing through Amazon, but she also always links to libraries. So you don't have to, you know, only push Amazon if you're an Amazon affiliate. But there, of course, the affiliate marketing world is so much bigger from Amazon. And I, as you know, because you have some really wonderful, strong relationships with particular programs in the writing community. Um, so for instance, um, at one point, I was an affiliate for Teachable, and I think you you mm, might have been I as am. well. Yeah. Um, and so I, these relationships for me like come and go because I it's a it's a smaller piece of what I do, mm. but it's something I'm always open to, um, depending on what my emphasis is. Mm. And I, I think the important thing with affiliate uh, income is to yeah, acknowledge the authentic links. As you say, the useful products that we use, I use Teachable and I recommend Teachable. I use ConvertKit, I recommend ConvertKit. So in this way, it's, um, it's you're choosing reputable services that you are involved with. And I think that's the key, isn't it? Um, Precisely. Yeah. So I want to come back to blogging um because it's quite so you you what did you say there you said uh that yeah that you've you you were concentrating more on blogging uh, and you put out stuff for free and that's why you had fewer books I think in the in the earlier days yeah. um but it's interesting how and you and I have known each other online because because our blogs have been around for so long because I think we I think we even first met because we were both up for one of the top 10 blogs or top 100 yes. yeah back in must have been 2010 or something like that um so what and you're still you still have blog posts all the time so what part does blogging play both in your business but also for your brand and um your book sales it's the number one lead generator for my entire business hands down always has been it might always will be i mean we'll see um so Basically, people go to Google and they ask a question and they end up at my site. So it's mainly organic search driven, meaning I don't pay for those people to come to my site. I'm not advertising on Google. It's just that my content ranks really well. And so I get visitors. And so once people end up at my site, if they find something that's quite useful to them, it helps build trust. It also builds authority because people are linking to me as you, you should go and read this thing by Jane. And then once people start to see that I know what I'm talking about, they dig a little deeper and they see that, oh, I have these services or I have this online education or I have this book. Um, mm -hmm. So that it it's a, a method of building a relationship with an audience. And the longer the blog is around, as you know, the more that kind of snowballs and becomes this kind of like fortress of, of credibility. And it has its own momentum to it. Mm. And so you don't even have to feed it as much once you're five years in, like, because there's so much of that cornerstone content sitting there that you can keep drawing from year after year that you don't have to work at. People mm. just find it and use it and share it. Yeah. So you must be coming up for 10 years as well. Yes, it depends on when you start the clock. Um, but it will, I think, if you start the clock in spring 2008, then yes, we're sitting on my 10 year anniversary. Yeah, that's what I thought. I'm, I'm in December. So the, I say the clock's the first blog post. So for me, that was <laughs> December the 8th, 2008. It's so funny. And we'll come back to longevity in a minute. But I do want to ask you, so when authors... Um, say, should I blog? Isn't it too late? You know, is it worth blogging? Particularly, let's say, nonfiction authors, I think. You know, well, what are your thoughts on nonfiction and or fiction blogging these days? It's never too late. Like, there's always demand for great content. But you can't just decide, I'm going to throw up a, a blog and be really informal and casual about it. And, uh, you know, and then suddenly book sales. Like, it's just, you have to be... <laughs> 
more strategic and think about search engine optimization and who is it that you're trying to reach and what are they searching for? What problem are you solving? And also get really focused. I think that's the big problem I see with both nonfiction and fiction authors is that they're kind of all over the place and they haven't really decided what it is that they're offering the market that's distinctive or unique or and they're and sometimes they don't find their blogging voice for a while because they're maybe they're a little bit new to online writing. Mm. So I think it's it can be easier for nonfiction authors to gain momentum because they typically have a little bit better insight into who they're speaking to um, because maybe they've already been teaching in some way or writing books or doing things that speak to that audience. With fiction, I think it becomes a more difficult question because you don't usually you know, serialize your work on your blog, or I don't recommend it. And so you have to think about the themes and the issues that you might address. Or are you going to do this sort of literary citizenship model where you're bringing attention to others' works in your same in the same genre or category? Mm. Yeah, and you talked about market there. And I've got I, I've, I've picked up a quote from the book, uh, which says, once you seek payment, you have to consider the market for what you're producing. So is that the problem that authors only think about seeking payment once they have finished? So they've forgotten the market before they've finished the book? Is, is that the kind of cart and horse problem? For nonfiction, I think it definitely is. And there's the the other issue is that <laughs> there's the sense that great work will just somehow magically find its audience. Mm -hmm. um, or that I think there's also an issue of entitlement, where if I'm writing, then I deserve payment. Well, no, <laughs> you don't. <laughs> really? Uh, people, like, it's this... This thing, I feel like it's become this bad meme, uh, at least in the U.S., that writers deserve to be paid. Well, they do, but we have to consider the demand for the work that you're producing. You don't automatically get what you would like to earn from your poem or short story or whatever it might be. Mm. I think that's really um, a good point. And actually, let's come to the academic side, because one of the things that annoys me uh, is this the world of grants, which is a very academic and, you know, sort of world, which I think reinforces that meme. Now, I absolutely think that there should be grants for different types of people who really need to be supported because of societal issues. <laughs> so uh, so I, hope, I hope we can put certain, you know, categories there. But it seems to me that so many writers, because of that meme, think that you know, oh, well, I'll just get a grant or, oh, I'll just, uh, you know, get this or that type of funding. So mm -hmm. ha where is that balance? How do we address that? Yeah. Grants and, and similar form, oh, I, I kind of lump grants into the patronage, whether it's patronage from an individual or an institution or the government or a nonprofit. It's like someone is gifting you time or money to get some writing done that might not otherwise be commercial or that you might not see a return on. So I think grants and similar forms of patronage are wonderful for some of the more like very art driven things that, especially poetry in the US, where it's you're probably not going to be making a living just selling the work outright. And mm. you know, some, some forms of art deserve that form of support. But then you have to think about, okay, I'm I'm going to have grants to help support the things that aren't very commercially minded, but I also have to think through how can I supplement that through other forms of writing or other forms of writerly work, whatever that means to you. And I think some people just get too focused on, I'm not a writer if I don't earn my money from the writing itself or from mm. selling the writing itself. And there's just a much bigger picture to look at um, that goes beyond payment for this poem. Mm. I actually read, um, you, you've probably read Big Magic by Elizabeth Gilbert. I haven't read it. Oh, it's haven't. on my got to read it. Stand. Got to read it or get the audiobook. It's a great audiobook. She reads it. But it, there's one really interesting bit where she talks about taking vows between her and creativity. And she said to creativity or her muse or whatever, I will support you. You don't have to support me. Yes. And that's obviously she hit with Eat, Pray, Love. And that's why we've all heard of her. But, you know, before that, she talks about all the things she did, you know, being a waitress and cleaning or whatever to support her art. And yeah, I mean, and that's why I think looking at the multiple streams of income is so important. You know, I don't make like 
like everything from book sales. It comes from right. lots of different things. So that's just so important. Okay, yeah. so another quote I have um, uh, that I picked up, actually from your Twitter stream, I was just having a look, is the this getting caught up on prestige. And coming back to your initial point, the sort of that a trad pub deal means they never have to do pretty much anything again. So has that ever been true? Like, is that, like you say, a meme or a myth? Or, you know, what is the reality th these days? Um, I think, especially in the literary community, there's the feeling that you do have to be vetted, selected, or validated by a particular editor, agent, or publisher in order for your work to ha get the attention that you want it to have. So that, and I think part of this has to do with just the tradition of creative writers funding their living through teaching. And so you couldn't get a reasonable teaching position without a certain track record of publication. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly in today's creative writing programs, if your professors are telling you this is how you do it and you look at their track record, it's with very particular journals and, you know, they're all following a very similar kind of model. And so everyone thinks like that's how you make it. You get the right names on your work. But I think especially now in the digital age uh, and also as the professor positions are kind of dwindling in quality, <laughs> <laughs> that you can't publish based on the prestige of the press or the editor that you're working with because it's not going to assure you a teaching position. It has nothing to do with sales. And so then why are you doing it? Are you just doing it because someone told you that's, you know, that's how you become respectable? And so, of course, there are many ways, like this goes so much beyond the writing and publishing world, um, about how we do things that are kind of crazy just because we think people will think better of us. And there's, of course, always been this tension um, between traditional publishing and self-publishing about uh, that, I think, really at its core, it's concerns and anxiety about one's status mm -hmm. as a writer uh, and how you're making your money. And I think the marketing thing goes right back to the status and prestige question. Like if your art is good enough or if you're important enough, then you don't have to market because you've reached that that level where other people do it for you mm. <laughs> in France and doesn't have a web, a website, right? So you want to achieve that level of status. Yeah, it was actually really funny. I mean, we'll come on to social media, but um, Elon Musk, you know, and Tesla deleting their Facebook page for Tesla. And I was like, yeah, well, he can do that because he, he doesn't need that that channel. Right. So, right. It, yeah, um, but it's interesting that status uh, money thing, because what's so interesting is that, uh, you know, with the successful indie thing, often people talk more about the money. I think because we are locked out of so many of the other forms of prestige, like awards. Um, right. But as you get up to a certain level of income, you start thinking more about awards, whereas the people who tend to win awards in the literary era start thinking about money. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> exactly. So you, yes. always want, you always want the other thing, right? <laughs> yes, grass is greener. <laughs> yeah. Which is quite funny but um let's come on to um and you know all these different things that we're talking about are, are covered in the book in different ways which is you know people didn't realize that <laughs> um but let's talk about the hot sheet because the hot sheet you do with porter anderson every two weeks and of course you do talk about email lists and email marketing in the book um so first of all i wanted to ask you like what are some of the trends because you, you it basically reports on what's going on fantastic um subscription i'll, I'll link to it in the show notes what are some some of the things you see going on that are new or interesting or even worrying in the in the community i think the issues that come up repeatedly have to do with the changing advertising landscape on facebook amazon and then also experimenting with other forms of advertising like on bookbub um, how goodreads has changed how they allow for giveaways which is like kind of the advertising model there so it's you know, you can't even look at what the advice was, I feel like, a year ago and apply the same methods right now. And that's causing a lot of, of course, frustration and anxiety about how to invest one's money wisely. And I think that at digital advertising, like you have to educate yourself continually in order to have effective ads and be willing to experiment and test. And so I think that's one of the issues that I see coming up month after month is how are these systems changing in terms of effectiveness um, and and cost. Uh, one of the other issues that keeps coming up is audiobooks. 
Um, the growth, of course, has been going for quite some time now, but I think everyone's getting a little bit more competitive and there's a little bit more bullying going on. <laughs> uh, so like uh, traditional publishers in the U.S., the big five, uh, will no longer sign a deal unless the audiobooks are included, the mm. audiobook rights. Uh, and this is, you know, it's frustrating. Um, and what if the publisher doesn't see enough profit in exploiting the audiobook rights and then they're tied up and you can't do anything yourself? So, like, this is becoming an issue. And then, of course, there's the Audible romance subscription package where the royalties <laughs> got announced and it was just kind of shocking how, how little was offered. And so that's also playing out. Um, there's still... Uh, I think this has been an issue for quite some time now, but it continues to be a, to create visceral reactions. Uh, Amazon KDP Select and the Kindle Unlimited program, how I think this is kind of creating a bifurcation in the market of uh, independent authors who are wide and are pretty diverse in how they're earning their money, um, such as yourself, you're the model for that. And then people who are very much in that KU ecosystem and trying to uh, get their money, not just from sales, but from the page reads. And so again, that's another thing where I, it's not that I think you can't play in both fields, but you tend to develop a specialty or an expertise in one or the other. Um, and I think it changes your worldview and philosophy as an author, depending on which path you're going down. Yeah, it's so funny because, of course, when we first met and, and were talking with the early indies, uh, you know, Amanda Hocking and all that, it really was at that time a sort of indie versus traditional discussion. And you don't really hear that anymore. Like you say, what you hear is the select versus wide uh, yes. discussion, which is, I never would have seen that coming. No, me either. And um, I don't know at what point there, there's an end to it unless Amazon changes, you know, what they're paying mm. or, or, or forces authors' hands in some way, which is what I'm, I wouldn't say I'm afraid of it, but um, like if they change the royalty rate, like if, unless you're exclusive, your royalty rate drops to 35%, let's say, and that is a pretty scary proposition. What happens at that point? Yeah, I totally agree with that. Um... I also think that perhaps the way that it could play out is similar to the way that we've seen with freelance um, blogging and freelance magazine and even freelance journalism, which is that the pay rates just got lower and lower, still are. And now mm -hmm. I have friends who are freelance writers who are like, a lot of people are doing this for free. I'm now having to get a job because yes. it's gone so low that right. they, they can't do writing for hire unless they've built a brand where they want that. So what are your thoughts on, on the sort of personal brand trumps all approach? <laughs> well, it's, it has to be a meaningful brand. So I think it can trump all. And I do encourage authors to play what I consider the long game in that they're putting their stuff out wide, they're diversifying their income streams, and they're building what is the most meaningful base of readers or fans possible. Um, that they're not people just um, who are with you for the first 10 pages of your book, and they're not interested in anything further, or they're just skipping around to the hot sex scenes in your romance audio book. <laughs> <Your> audiobook. <laughs> um, that it's... That, it's something where people, once you announce that whatever new thing you've got, that they're going to be enthusiastic and they're going to want to pay you for it. So I think it also allows you just a lot of escape hatches. Um, so like if something dramatic does happen with Amazon's royalty rates, then you can look at something like a Patreon uh, to help with uh, individual readers funding you month to month. And I'm already seeing a lot of exciting uh, activity there from all all types of authors, literary authors, genre authors, freelancers. It's really impressive and it gives me, it, it inspires me even to, to think about what the potential is for myself and for others I'm advising. Yeah, and thanks to everyone who supports the show on Patreon who are yes. <laughs> listening right now. Have you, have you got a Patreon? Have you started one yet? No, I haven't. Um, and uh, part of it's just time and focus. Like I could, but I, there's just other things that are, are for, like, you know, higher on the priority list. Yeah, I mean, I think similar to the way Christine Catherine Rush has done it would be a way that, that you could do it without too much extra work in that, Absolutely. you know, it's just people who already want to support you. And that's why yes. I think that personal brand is, is important um, yes. over the long term because 
regardless if KU works for a bit longer, um, you know, it, it, I just I just have that ultimate fear of everything being dependent on one company. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, agreed. Just crazy. But let's get coming back to the hot sheet and email marketing. So we've got a few things going on right now. We're recording this in March 2018. And um, the U European Union is bringing in the GDPR ruling, which uh, let's not get too technical. I've mm. talked about this on on my introduction to a previous show. Um, but it's basically you have to get more permissions. It's this backlash against big data being everywhere. And it means double opt in. It means being very clear on what's going on. So how do you think that the uh, the rules, these types of rules, which were ne inevitably going to spread across everything, as well as the backlash against Facebook, how is this going to play out with, with big data and privacy and marketing? Well, just in the short term with email in particular, I think if you're using one of the major services, thankfully, I think a lot of some of the technical issues will be sorted for you. Like if you're with a MailChimp or a ConvertKit, like they have to do things to make you, uh, help you be compliant. Mm. And so as long as you're following their best practices and educating yourself um, on anything you might be doing outside of the auspices of your email service provider, I think generally if you're working with a staff established companies, you'll probably be okay. Um, I think it's when you start to look at some of the like, I don't want to say like shadier ways of collecting email addresses, but just some of the like, you know, the less, um, I, I, yeah, I, I don't want to like criticize how people collect their emails, but I have seen like some shocking methods of building up a list that I don't think would abide by what the current regulations mm. that are coming. I think, I think we can say that these involve things like list sharing um, mm. or uh, giveaways. I've seen sometimes yes. these giveaways that don't, don't make it clear that you're going to end up on multiple right. authors lists. Um, exactly. So is it just a case of being much more aware of it awareness and discipline and i think it's going to end up being healthier for everybody <laughs> absolutely yeah yeah absolutely and then what about the uh facebook backlash and changes and also i just um i just found out just before this call and just told you just before this call that twitter have changed their evergreen scheduling rules so i've been using um scheduling where i load up my backlist and it auto posts so i just haven't needed to do much uh, and now okay. they've banned that so you cannot post the same tweet twice and they're getting rid of of all of that so that will impact people like you and me who are, i think are ethical <laughs> and yes. abiding by the rules but they're changing the rules so, so how is that going to affect things and Facebook changes? On the Facebook side, I feel like the current angst is going to blow over. I mean, there's certainly going to people, there, there will be people who depart and, and maybe they won't come back. But the Facebook size is just so tremendous that I don't think the departures are going to ultimately affect Facebook as a marketing tool. Mm. Uh, the other thing that I'm seeing and that I've participated in myself is more group interactions. So rather than having to driving likes to your official business page, you're instead engaging with people in groups, which Facebook has said so far that they're trying themselves to encourage and promote. Um, so they're trying to get you know get you to to more meaningful exchanges between people who know each other rather than, you know, the the, the company PR marketing stuff that looks really too markety. Mm. <laughs> uh, so again, I think it's probably like the changes that I think are going to happen at Facebook or that have been happening, I think is going to result in a in a better environment. Although I, that's relative. I have to say that's relative to what it has been. I don't mean like... Um, objectively. So uh, there's people who have serious problems with, with Facebook and I don't think it's like a must engage place. Mm. Um, although it, you have, you have to have a really strong alternate in order to replace, I think the potential that Facebook offers given its size mm. uh, with Twitter. I have actually had a, an extremely lax and informal strategy there. And so the changes haven't and I don't think will particularly affect me because I tend to only tweet in live time, mm. uh, which means that I'm not actually using the tool to its fullest potential for me. Um, but it hasn't, it just hasn't, again, it hasn't been a priority. So, but I, I, I can already see it affecting some others because I think if I'm not mistaken, Twitter 
already disallowed multiple, like sending out the same tweet through multiple accounts at once. Yes. That was and so, the first change and now they've yeah. taken it further. Yeah. Yeah. So I've already seen actually some good changes <laughs> from that because I was getting hit multiple times by the same tweets from the same, like I, this happens a lot, I think in the writing and publishing world and mm. well, all across marketing. And so I felt like that was actually a good move. Um, but this other move, I feel like, I, I don't know, I, I would have to I think I'm just going to have to see what happens before I can really comment more. But I'm curious to know what you think. Mm. What you're gonna do. Well, it's, it really is interesting. I think all of this to me means that what my sh my kind of way of doing things so far has been to try and automate things so I can still I have an, a virtual assistant I have like one and a bit uh, virtual assistants and people I work with but I've tried to do most things by automation and scheduling so that I don't have to build a big company and employ loads of people to do all this stuff so for me the removing of various automation tools may mean that I scale back on yeah a lot of this yeah. um but i think other things will emerge so things like the 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 dates the email stuff the social media thing as you say it feels like a sort of contraction of people who really care so and that's a good thing like mm -hmm. so instead of having you know a hundred thousand people on your email list of which only one percent open maybe you only need a lot fewer right and yes. same with social media. So maybe it feels like that. It feels a contraction in a good way. Yes. Yes. I would, I would agree. Yeah. Okay, cool. So basically you and I, are, well, I think I'm just uber, uber positive and you're positive, but with the academic spin, which means you're always <laughs> a bit more cautious. <laughs> I am. Yes. <laughs> but generally we're saying, don't worry, everybody. <laughs> Yeah, I don't. I And I also think if you're in it for the long haul, as we both are, these changes just, I mean, yeah, they can be painful on a temporary basis, but you're just, you get on with it. Like there, there's so many other things to do. So why? <laughs> be upset <laughs> yeah exactly and and it's funny like like you say the things that have happened like with seo um there was penguin and panda and all these other animals that changed the algorithms over the years and it's rewarded people like you and me who have always done quality content right and we never tried to scam anyone and we've ended out coming you know you and i generally if people are searching for stuff we will be in the you know the top few pages of of google right. um you know i'm always like oh jane's there <laughs> <laughs> you know, and then and then someone will say, you know, so that's really interesting because those changes have always rewarded quality, and that's what yes. we've got to stick to. Okay, exactly. so I did want to ask. Um, go on, we're almost out of time. Just a couple more questions. So the the book is published by the University of Chicago Press. Um, so and you explained why you wanted it to go that way, as in to reach that type of market. But how? Are there changes in academic publishing? Because it seems like, I mean, this, like I said to you, wow, your print book, I think I said, in the UK, it's expensive. And you said, well, it's the academic press, it's aimed at that market. But that just seems weird. Why, why do they get to be more expensive just because they're academic? Yeah, a question we're all still trying to answer. <laughs> uh, the, the scholarly academic publishing market is undergoing so much upheaval right now. And it and part of it has to do with, I think, self-inflicted wounds of, you know, putting out new editions so frequently um, in order to, to boost profits, because now you, uh, students can't uh, go buy a used edition on the cheap. They have to get the new edition if the assuming the professor requires it. So there, and, and then there's also students who, and professors who are tr because of the high prices in the market, are trying to go to open source resources or point people to free online information like our blog posts. You know, every every field has its own repository of freely available advice and information. So relying less on textbooks. And so this Pearson is the number one. I think publisher in the world from a revenue perspective, and it's you know largely an academic publisher, but it's also part owner of Penguin Random House. But in any event, it's it's been selling off its stake of Penguin Random House because it's suffering so badly mm -hmm. on on the scholarly academic end. Um, fortunately, the press that I'm with, Chicago, uh, is also a distributor of a lot of other titles, and they have their own warehousing and uh, also their own POD printing. So they have a little bit of a more of a what I would consider a stable foundation, and they also have 
what's called the et- writing, editing, and publishing series that they do, uh, sparked in part because they do the big Chicago guide. It's the big style guide in the United States that all of the book publishers use, the traditional uh, book yes. publishers. Chicago Manual of Style, is it? Yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. So they publish that tome every so often. And so they have this spinoff series, which my book is a part of. So I really wanted to have that association, although I will say the number one I, I wouldn't call it a complaint. Uh, the number like number one question is like, oh my God, why is it so expensive? And mm. that's a yes, that's a problem when people are dissuaded. And I've noticed that Amazon has started discounting because they have that ability, mm. and so that actually makes it a little more favorable. But you know what's going to happen is that. Uh, some other third party seller is probably going to win the buy box on my book. Mm. Um, and they may be selling used copies, uh, because they're undercutting the publisher's, uh, price and, and, and even Amazon's price. So it's a, it's very weird. Um, but... I, I, I will look forward to a blog post from you on the vagaries of pricing. <laughs> <laughs> because it's an interesting experiment. And the other thing I would say, because it is nonfiction, and I'm generally, you know, I'm just happy to spend more money on nonfiction, especially on business, because yeah. I feel like all I need is a couple of tips and I've made that money back. So I'd just like to tell everyone um, to go and check out your book. Um, and and to, when they when you, you know, which is the business of being a writer. And, uh, find, you know, there's lots of information there that's incredibly useful. So why don't we do that? Tell people what else they can find in the book. Uh, I would say probably the most interesting thing for the average writer who's wanting to make a living are the last two parts. So part four is the writer is entrepreneur, which kind of lays out what it means to have lead generation in your career in order to get more paying opportunities. And then part five is about business models and different revenue streams that you can have. And so I, that, that's where I actually break out my own kind of income and look at all the percentages. And so everything from like freelancing to teaching to affiliate income to patrons. And so trying to, you know, encourage people to think outside of the book sale type of income to all the different pieces that might play a role. Mm. No, it's a fantastic book. And I'll look forward to being in your also bots. And I'm sure you'll be in my also bots yes. for business for authors. And I, I really like that because when I put business for authors out like years ago now, I think it was around 2014. Um, it was the only book on mm-hmm. that topic. And then since then, there have been some other books that, yes. you know, and yours is obviously the latest one. James Scott Bell has got one and then other people have put stuff out. But that idea of business for authors, I think, is now mainstream the fact that you've now done the textbook the academic right. book well it's not a textbook the the more you know that end of the scale education is is just fantastic so where can people find you and everything you do online uh janefriedman.com is the best place that points to all my books courses and also the hot sheet the newsletter we talked about mm, fantastic well thanks so much for your time jane that was great thank you joanna